the less talked about moments on the periphery of the Israel-Hamas war need a look. They're not huge attacks, but they're dangerous, they matter, and they might be changing. We are seeing uh, escalation on the Lebanese-Israeli front. We are seeing missiles from the Houthis. We are seeing missiles and rockets from Iraqi militias attacking U.S. assets in Syria and Iraq. This is Randa Slim of the Middle East Institute. And she's talking about a term and group we might soon hear a lot about. They call themselves the Axis of Resistance, entities funded by and ideologically aligned with Iraq. What does it mean? Who is in it? Axis of Resistance refers to a, an umbrella, if you can put it, organization that includes Hamas, include Islamic Jihad on the Palestinian side, Hezbollah on the Lebanese side, various militias in Syria affiliated with Iran, various militias in Iraq affiliated with Iran. Uh, and of course, it includes the Iranian Revolutionary Guards. It's part of what they call the forward defense strategy. There has been a decision made by Iran, along with its partners and proxies, to start unifying the fronts. And that was announced about a year and a half ago. If Israel thinks of attacking any, any of us, I mean in the resistance axis, it's going to be a multi-front war confronting Israel. This is how world wars start. Exactly. I mean, so far, everybody is a little bit restrained and deterred by the fear of this regional war, because they know what this regional war would looks like. So here's what we're talking about. In the north, you have Hezbollah with, it said, 150,000 long-range precision missiles aimed directly at Israel. Then in Iraq and Syria, the Iran-backed militias there have been increasing their drone attacks against American bases. Because the U.S. is the main backer of Israel, the message from Iran there is back off. And then there's Yemen, some 2,000 kilometers away. The Houthi rebels there, trained, backed by Iran, have been increasing their sporadic missile fire at Israel. So far, that's more flex than fight. The Houthis quick to release a video days ago showing off weaponry and intent, declaring war on Israel. So now Israel has sent missile defensive ships to the Red Sea the U.S., two aircraft carriers and a nuclear-powered submarine to the Mediterranean. And there's more posturing in Tehran daily. Iranian state media reporting the leader of Hamas met Iran's supreme leader recently, as they did in June. So the money and training and ideology are all Iran. The might, though, rests largely with Hezbollah. Curiously, in his speech recently, Hezbollah's leader did not indicate a multi-front offensive was imminent. What are the reasons why it wouldn't want to expand this? Hezbollah understand they are operating in a country that is facing dire economic straits. The majority of the Lebanese public opinion does not want the war. Iran, too, has its own domestic chaos, maybe worried that going bigger on a war might threaten its stability. Here's another calculation. Iran and its proxies may not believe that they actually need a larger war. They know that the history of attempted regime changes suggests they rarely work. So Israel talks of destroying Hamas, but there's no guarantee that at the end of all this bloodshed, Hamas or the idea of Hamas will actually be gone. If Iran's reported red line for getting more involved is the destruction of Hamas, then it will closely watch the rate of rocket fire from Gaza into Israel. That it continues with such ferocity suggests Hamas has been stockpiling for this moment for years. You have to think that they were aware this was a possible uh, retaliation, so you would expect them to have held some of these weapons in strategic reserve. This is weapons specialist Nick Jensen-Jones. Presumably since October 7th, there's no resupplying for Hamas. The resupply is going to become more difficult from external sources, but Hamas has maintained an internal capability to produce weapons, including rockets. And I expect that their relatively simple rocket designs will continue to be produced as the conflict uh, is waged. When Hamas launched its murderous atrocities, those who could bring themselves to look at the horrors captured on body cameras saw more than the bloody rampage. 
they started to take account of the weapons, grenades, RPGs, even weapons from North Korea. This all paints a picture, and tracking the weaponry is what Jensen Jones does. North Korea has been a strong supporter uh, of Palestinian independence for decades. They've supplied arms for decades, uh, again, almost entirely through Iran. So how are these weapons getting in there? A lot of it's small scale smuggling. There's capture uh, from Israeli forces, so from previous conflicts, and already we've seen from this most recent attack, uh, Israeli weapons being captured and, and already repurposed. And then there's the um, more concerted efforts to supply Hamas maritime and land based smuggling, primarily maritime. So there are weapons in Gaza, for example, that we have tracked from the 2011 conflict in Libya. And we know some of those came over the sea from Libya to Gaza. That he knows from serial numbers and open source intelligence. But the bulk of what he says Hamas has is either old or locally produced. If there's something more powerful in the arsenal, they're hiding it or lying in wait. I expect that over the coming weeks and months, we'll have a, a pretty good handle on uh, what percentage of the arsenal has been expended. While Hamas still has its weapons stockpile and hides behind its hostages, the so-called axis of resistance may not see the need to escalate. But a lot can change. Confusion on the ground, mistakes, rogue generals, Palestinians getting pushed out of Gaza. The region is a tinderbox, and any of that may make it ignite.